Welcome to the Creator Launchpad. We want to see your idea for a new original show concept. So get together with your friends and shoot an episode. We'll watch your video, and if we love it, we'll hire you to join our team and direct more episodes. Click on the link in the description below for more information. I don't, I don't even I don't even know what queer means because you have a different definition. I'm sure you have one. And I'm sure you have one, and I'm sure you have one. 2022, baby, you better look up what queer means. It's, it's often used off the. So you guys, so hold on. <laughs> Forward if you agree with the prompt. It is important that parents honor their children's boundaries. I like the phrase boundaries breed intimacy. Um, if you don't have that respect, mutual respect for one another, how can I be open with you as a child? There's that lack of trust if you're not respecting boundaries. It's also important because each kid is different and I have a brother and boundaries that work for me don't work for him. And so my parents parent both of us according to what we need and that involves having different boundaries. So, And like to honor your child's boundaries does not mean at your boundaries, there's a deficit at my boundaries. Like my kid is not going to be cussing me out, telling me what he's not gonna do. It's none of that. I can, I can respect my child and I have a 14 year old son and he respects me. I've never had any issues with rebellion or I guess disrespect in that way because we communicate about everything now. And you know, there is a line of course that you don't want to cross, you know, especially when it comes to the safety of the child. It is 100% safety, and it just means you respect their emotions as a human. It doesn't mean you let your kid do whatever you want. I think that's a common misconception. Can the disagreer step forward? I would like it if the prompt was worded almost a little bit differently because it, it puts importance on my kid's boundaries, where I think as a parent, we set those boundaries. But I like what you said, where you said that just because uh, boundaries are set doesn't give you know your child the ability or the reason to cuss you out because it's like, oh, well, I've set these boundaries up and that's my boundary. It seems like people are equating boundaries with, with emotions, and mm -hmm. I would not do that. Yeah. I would say that their emotions are different from their the boundaries that we as parents should be setting for them. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I broke every boundary that my parents set for me and they were there for specific reasons, to keep me safe. So if we just allow our children to have no boundaries or we allow them to set the standard for the boundaries, I think that they're just not emotionally, to bring that word back, capable of doing that and keeping themselves safe. I think that's our job as parents. Yeah, I think too, talk, uh, going off of that, that the, the relationship you have with a parent uh, is very contingent on the child uh, knowing that the parent has your best interest at heart. And like you said, there were many times in my childhood that I wanted to do something and I didn't have the same boundary that my parents did. Maybe I didn't have all the information. I'm glad that they protected me and they had my best interest at heart. Uh, and I think that that's important for the, the parent-child relationship. Can I throw in a follow-up question? Let's redirect and think about boundaries too as autonomy. Okay, go. Encompassing what though? As an example, a little kid doesn't feel comfortable hugging a family member, you must hug them anyway. That's your uncle, hug them. And they're trying to tell you. Absolutely not. I, I was actually about to talk on that. I think it's less about the child setting the boundary with the parent. I think parents should definitely like have the final say in terms of those boundaries, but I think it's more about fostering conversation with the children that you are an individual, you do have autonomy just for this phase of your life. I will take the lead, I am the parent, but instilling in the child that you are your own person and you're not just an extension of me. I have a six-year-old, a two-year-old, and 11th month old son. So there is no boundaries because you can't have boundaries if there's no foundation in order. You know, so uh, for me, what I strive to do is to, uh, with my six-year-old, is just give her lots of words of affirmation um, and be the lead in everything we do. You know, um, she rides horses, we go out to the range, she shoots guns. A lot of the structure and foundation that we're planning is, you know, in the outdoor world, it's not based off social media, tablets, cell phones, and reality TV shows. But if I'm just saying, well, you know, well, I'm gonna wait until she tells me what her boundaries are, I'm gonna wait and see how she feels, 
Well, that's not a parent. That's a friend. But isn't that what happens? You're, the, the parents set the, the precedent. This is the right. law. This right. is the rules and regulations. It's the foundation, whether it's Christianity, whether it's whatever that you believe in your household. And then you get you do have your autonomy as a child, and you do start challenging your parent because your ideas and their ideas might not align just the same way anymore. And that oh, is absolutely. when the kid has a... So if your daughter, let's say said, you know what, Daddy, I don't want to wear these clothes no more. I don't want to wear this pink dress. I don't want to wear these frills. I don't want to dress like a girl. I want to cut my hair off. What would you say? That wouldn't be up to me. That would be up to our mother. Okay. What would, what would, you, what would you guys say? I would imagine that together you guys um, make that decision. Good answer. Then, then, well, well, you know, in all honesty, I, um, I do work. I have a, a career and stuff, but I'm a stay-at-home father at, at the same time. So I'm the one who dresses. I'm the one who does the hair. Sure. But at the same time, it would be up to her mom to decide, okay, well, how can we go about this? And also, if she's having these feelings, we're gonna stop for a second, not just hop on and say, okay, well, she says that she wants to dress like a boy now, or she says she wants to do this now. Well, let's see where it's coming from. Because obviously, if she's not seen it in our home, then she saw it from somewhere. That's not true. I was five years old when I told my mom, I do not want to wear this pink dress. And, I didn't, and my parents are pastors, are Christian, and I was adopted in Michigan, Grand Rapids, I don't Michigan. Think that really I'm just, I'm just saying all that. these things. I, I was the only black child in my entire school district. We were in the paper for being the for bringing multiculturalism to the school district. So I didn't see any tomboys. I didn't see no gay folk. I didn't see nothing. What my point is, I had a call. I guess you would say a calling of autonomy for who I am. And I'm unapologetic for it because I always follow that as a six, seven, eight, nine year old. And thankfully, I had two parents that might not have understood, right. but did fortify me to be myself and never forced me to wear the clothes that I didn't want to wear. My thing is absolutely give a strong foundation for your children. That's your right. You wouldn't have brought children in this world to not do that. But you got to be a listener. If your child is saying something that kind of is like, wait, where is this coming from? Oh, absolutely. It might not absolutely. be coming from social media or TV. It might be coming from their heart and their authenticity Well, absolutely. Well, well, that's also our job as parents to search their heart. You know, just because a child Isn't says... It? Absolutely. To search your child's heart? Absolutely. To or search to accept your, your child heart. who they are? Search your child's heart. I don't think we're actually in a conversation to even be talking about dressing or, or how your kid feels about their at gender six, identity. At six years old? You can't... Your, your child can't We're talking decide. about boundaries. We're not talking about we're talking sexual about orientation with no, children. No, we're talking about autonomy. Okay. And autonomy yeah, but you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't... You shouldn't accept your child for everything, everything that they, they think. Say. Like, I, I used not? to dress up and, like, think I was a pirate, but my parents didn't cut off my arm and attach a hook. Like, not that's everything a, should just be firm. No, but it's not. But what I'm I'm saying is, you don't accept everything simply because they say it. Self mutilation and accepting your daughter for being gay is a little bit not 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 apples to apples, my friend. But my point is that you don't just blindly accept for anything. You do accept them for some things, but it's not just blind. They said it, and therefore we should accept them for what they said. It's not necessarily accepting. It's more of letting them explore. It's more of them giving them an option to find themselves. I, 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 I have twins. I think that's a reckless. A reckless I have twins, and uh, twin girls, and they're five now. And at two and a half, one of them didn't want to wear dresses anymore. She, she was like adamant about it at two and a half. And I'm like, whoa, this is powerful. And we went with it. We wanted her to explore that. We wanted to make sure that she felt comfortable in her own skin on what she was wearing. And I didn't want to put that on her and make sure that, you know, she has this femininity that maybe she doesn't feel like she has. You know, that's not saying that she's gay or she's lesbian or anything. She just doesn't like dresses. I would agree And to this day, she's five and she still doesn't wear dresses. And, and she might she like happy. dresses in a couple of years. She might change her mind and yeah. actually like dresses. Yeah. And that's her choice. Exactly. I, have, I have a question. It, it's personal to you because I don't know if I heard it correctly. Did you say you were adopted? I was. Okay, you had adopted parents. Do you think They're that... the only parents I recognize as my parents, okay. but I was adopted. Do you, yes. do you think that their willingness to be, let's just use the word liberal in uh, acceptance and, want, and you wanting to do the things that you do is because they are your adopt, adopted Absolutely parents and maybe not. that they felt this obligation that they want to be closer to you? Absolutely not. I'm the only one adopted okay. in my family and my mom and dad actually do not believe in my lifestyle mm. and, they're, and they're unapologetic for that and I respect it because everybody has to believe in what they believe in. So even though they don't believe that my lifestyle is necessarily of God or of their faith, we can still come to terms and love each other and be with each other because I'm not my thoughts and my parents aren't their thoughts either. We're bigger than that, and they have the right to believe. Right. So you said that note. Move on to the next prompt. It's best for a child to have a mother 
and a father. I'm gonna set this one down. You thought about that one for a second. I, like that. I did, yeah. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> well, I mean, I I think it's kind of obvious, right, for, for a plethora of reasons, but I think the, the, the ordered way is, you know, a mother and a father for, for two different people that have two different and distinct purposes. Uh, we all know mothers are just inherently better at nurturing. They, they provide life, they give life, and I think both of those two distinct roles are absolutely important and integral to uh, child development, I think. Yeah, I can speak to my own experience. I had. Uh two parents in the home, uh, very loving, um, and it was really vital to have a masculine figure and also a feminine figure. I think if you have too much of either, that can affect you in negative ways um, as a kid. The, the problem that I have with the same-sex parenting is that when you have a same-sex couple that has a child, they're necessarily depriving that child of a mother and the father, and they're excluding a parent in one of those important roles from the child. And we, we have a lot of data on this. Social scientists have tons of studies and research about this, uh, decades, that non-biological parents are more transitory than biological parents, um, that when a child loses a, a parent, that there's a lot of trauma involved. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that sexes are different and children need models for both of those things. And it isn't to say that homosexuals can't love and commit. Um, and it's also not to say that heterosexuals can't be bad parents. I think we know that as well. But it is to say that we shouldn't set up a system in which children are intentionally put in homes that are fatherless or motherless. That isn't fair to the child. I feel like same-sex parents adopting are thrusting the child into their lifestyle instead of realizing and asking the better question, which is, what is best for that child? And I hear the side that we will be good parents, but no man can be a mother and no woman can be a father. And even if you are the best same-sex couple in the world, you still are necessarily denying that child a parent. And I believe that children have rights and that the most important right is a, a right to a mother and a father. And they have that right by virtue of being brought into this world by those two people. I also don't want to add on to that because like you touching on like the masculinity and the femininity. The thing is, you can only display so much masculinity and femininity. The thing is, like, it doesn't matter if you're a biological woman and you're trying to exert as much masculinity as possible. At the end of the day, a child's gonna grow up in a same-sex household and they're gonna go to school and then see that other parents have a father figure, a mother figure, and they're gonna grow up and start, and just all this stuff about same-sex couples, like gender, all this stuff's gonna come to them at a very young age. They're one-dimensional. They're not gonna take it in the same way that we do. So I just feel like at, from a very young age, it would confuse the kid. I was raised by a single mother, and so I was raised by all women. Um, so, like I was saying before, you know, I do hair, I grew up in salons, I grew up, you know, watching my mom getting her eyebrows waxed, and I was always, um, you know, masculine uh, as, a, as a young boy, but the validation and the insecurities just continued to grow as I became older. As far as um, working and being committed to something and finishing a task, those were areas that I lacked in, but one area that I knew about and was so familiar about was women. But as far as having a man say, hey, this is actually what the woman is for. She's not to be your plaything. She's actually a valued person with emotions and standards and morals and values. And this is how you should, you know, treat a woman. So to have a father in my life would have kept me from doing a ton of stuff that ended up hurting me emotionally later on and causing a lot of trauma. You know, so now that I have a son, I hug him and give him that uh, masculine, if you would say, um, you know, emotional embrace. You know, and I think that's important. You can't just get that from one or the other or the same sex. I believe I, I believe it can only come from a mother and a father. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I also, not only is it, you know, as a Christian, it's not biblical to represent that to our children, but I don't think it's a sustainable model either, either if you're looking at it from that perspective. Like, if we're gonna normalize same-sex households, we will have a very, difficult reproduction issue down the, down the line. Think if every single family suddenly became a single sex household. There's a reason why mammals have a male and a female and they reproduce. You know, that's just the, that's the way we're built. That's the way we're built biologically and from God. I don't agree with most of the shit you guys said, um, but I do agree about balance, okay? I am a queer mother 
of a 14 year old male. And I believe that he definitely benefits from a male in his life as well as me in his life. Now, the thing that you guys really aren't touching on is that most queer families are not just the deficit of the opposite sex. There's a lot of extended family. Like, I make sure that my son has lots of male influence because I know like you like what you're talking about is a thousand percent true, especially in the black community. The destruction of the black household is just a whole different conversation. But because I know that, it is my it is my responsibility to make sure he's got a strong male influence or a few of them in his life. Now if they're not a father, they can be a father figure. I'm adopted, so I don't necessarily agree with everything you said about the biology of family, because I believe the only thing that's real in this world is love, and I do believe anybody can love and fortify a child a beautiful environment, but I do believe a child does benefit from male and female energy, and that is best of my opinion. So I disagree. Um, clearly, uh, uh, being a <clears throat> two male household uh, with two uh, little girls, like you were saying, you know, I have a lot of strong women in my life and in my husband's life. And, you know, we, we make sure that they are a part of our lives. They are a part of our girls' lives, that they know them very well, that they feel comfortable with them. And I have even told them at five years old, you know, if you don't feel comfortable ever coming to me about any kind of situation, you have your aunt, you have your grandma, you have these awesome, amazing women in your life that you can talk to and you should feel open about it. Do you really think that it's your extended family's job, as like you mentioned, like strong female figures, do you think it's their job for them to parent your own kid? Because they're not we were, parenting. Not it's at all. just an influence. We were talking yeah. about like extended relatives, but what about immigrant families where all of your extended relatives are in a different country, a different time zone. It doesn't I even have, it to, doesn't be have like, to be family, though. It yeah. can be like chosen I. Chosen family. It can be chosen family. It's just some woman or some man in your life that has a, a relationship with that child, and it's not their job to parent, but it's their job to maybe step in and give that. Like I know for me, I have two dads, and I have strong female figures in my life. They never parented me, but sure, I know that they're there if I need them. I mean, you know, when I got my period, I went to my dads. I didn't want to go to any woman because they're my parents and they made me feel loved. And there was, I had never ever once wanted a mom, sought a mom, thought I was missing something because I didn't have a mom, and I'm sick and tired of people telling me that I am missing something because I'm just well, that's, not. It's because you didn't have it. Um, yeah, but do you feel like you're missing something or you're not missing having two dads because you didn't have it? Well, no, no, that, no. that's not what we're oh, talking we're about because what, what happened, no, 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 because okay. what happens is... You're missing out then. What, because I don't have two dads? <laughs> I can't like, them, that? but I can't... No, 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 hold on, hold on, because we all know, you know this and I know this, there's, there's this bond that a mother and child have that nobody can replace. I don't care if it's another dad. I don't care if it's aunt. I don't care if it's a grandmother. Wrong. That, there was a study on, done on showing that the fathers about, form the same studies. biological studies connection. Mean nothing to me. Studies mean nothing to me. I want to hear him it's, out. It's, I want to hear this reality. guy out right here. Listen, What's he saying? You saying that I've never cared about having a mom. It never bothered me. I have two dads. They're great. You're saying that because you don't have your mother, which kills me. That kills me to think that I'm you sorry, never knew it her. <laughs> it doesn't kill me. That is well, wild. Well, what if her mom, what if well, her mom, what if her biological mom, let's just say her biological sure. mom was a drug addict, a prostitute, like my biological right. mom, that did not hold me the that's, first that's, three months. I'm not missing her, hon. I'm not missing her. We're not talking about best case scenario. We're talking about optimal scenario. But this is a real life scenario. This is a real life scenario. I don't, I don't, I don't miss that comfort. But, but you her. don't know that because it, because you don't but know you her. You don't know that because you're not me. Exactly. So but you what I'm, what I'm, other queer what I'm, tell them what they're missing. First of all, first of all, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know what queer means because you have a different definition. I'm sure you have a different different definition. I'm sure you have one. And I'm sure you have one, and I'm sure you have one. It's 2022, baby. You better look up what queer means. It's, it's often used off the. So you guys, off so hold on. Now. You guys have the exact same <laughs> like, definition no, of what just, a queer no, 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 person. No, no, no. I, only, I get the definition from school, from schooling, from from academia. Okay. I know. I don't, I don't think any part of the conversation really bothered me so much. I think the the one thing that I wish I could have nailed down was a clear definition of of what being queer is. I understand that each person, and I actually said it, each person probably has his or her own definition. You know, the same way if they asked us what a conservative was, we probably would have had a definition for it. But I just wish that, you know, that definition would have helped me frame maybe some of my questions a little bit better that I had. You know. I'm talking about you guys right here. About you guys. We're, we're all the same here, honey. No, we're, all, we're, all, we're all human beings. No, with equality blood is a false god. Equality is a false people, god. Honey. We are not all the same. He's black. 
I'm I'm mixed. White, wow. white, we're not the same. What, oh my God. What, whatever you characterize me is a very small bit of me because you don't know me. I can't judge exactly, you. Exactly, so I wouldn't assume you. to say well, that, I'm, not, we're all, that we're me and you are the same. Beings. We're, we're all, we're all human beings. Inequality is what actually makes everything good. I mean, we were just talking about how, you know, there, that somebody in your life, like an aunt, is filling the role of the mother. I didn't I say mean, filling mean, the role. But you said, you said some woman. A mother is not some woman. A mother is a mother. And no matter who you are. I have some woman who I can go to if I need them. And they're a And she's not missing out on a mother because she doesn't have one, yeah, and nobody should be able to tell her that. Of course, she, she has a mother. She just doesn't have a relationship. I didn't have my father my whole entire, you know, childhood. From the age of 22 until now, I have a good relationship with my father. I was missing something. I didn't really have a great relationship with my mother. My mother never talked to me. Never said two words to me. I had absolutely nobody. So to say that, oh, I don't need a But mom. being raised by a single it's, parent it's not, and being raised by a two-parent two household, but, foundationally, economically, about, spiritually, it's about it that, is about that. Day, it is about that. At the, the, end, the end of the day, I don't want my household to be a free-for-all for anybody and everybody to come with their political views, their religious views. If I say I don't want my daughter to have sex before marriage, I don't want my best friend Susie to come and say Absolutely well you know not. you know well you know you pick your I, that's what my household I'm not, is I'm not talking about Absolutely. I'm talking about I agree. my household I agree a thousand I'm not percent. talking about you I don't know about your situation that's what okay, I'm saying is as far as me and my house I'm not going to let any and everybody whether I love them I understand what you guys are saying about as love you trust trust as me you I understand what you guys are saying about love and I agree and it be, children it be, it be, it be need love but also children need order Absolutely so therefore, so therefore, in a same-sex house, the order, of, the natural order is being stripped away. I'm not saying you don't love your daughters. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying the order. You love your, your two dads? That's great. They support you. They love you. They do things for you. They provide for you. That's amazing. But you're missing the substance of order that can help you help guide you well, can I in speak? different directions. Can I, can I yes, speak, sure, please? Sure. What am I missing? Point, pinpoint exactly what I am missing. A mother. And how, right, what am I missing from that? The fundamental difference between so a mother can, and a father. Okay, so what can you point to in me? Look, that I don't know you. I don't, I don't know you. That's I, I why can, I asked I can, the I question originally. This. I can say this. We don't know you personally. Mm -hmm. So when we say that you're missing something from not having a mother, you're missing guidance in different ways. Anybody what, can, where? look, anybody can fabricate emotion. I have two daughters. I can go to my daughter and I can play Barbies with my daughter. She puts on her dresses, I'll be the king, she's the princess, and I can do, I can get on the ground crawling, I can f make myself be feminine enough for uh, me and her to have a good time. But the real femininity can only come from her mother. I can wise. only do so wise. much. Wait, 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 that's why I have a question. Stop, stop, stop. Wild. Real quick, we need to move on in just a moment. We haven't heard from Brittany or Alexa. I think it's really important to realize that it takes a village. It takes a village to raise children. So with Elizabeth coming from a two-parent household, which was a big topic for the agreeers here, a two-parent household, I don't think she's missing on anything. I raise my children with my wife. My daughter knows no different. You know, she is not missing anything. Neither is my son. Do you think one day they will? Absolutely not. I, I have a question. I have a question. I don't know how to ask this question. Was it like, uh, with you, were you with a male when you had your daughter? Yes, I was. Okay. So I guess my question is more so for people who, for queer people who adopt children. Okay. Is there a agenda connected to it to purposely, for the sake of society, community, you know, to adopt children into your home to prove a point. I think that's I what I causes, I think that's what you, causes though. the problem. Well, if you're well, having well, a kid for well, a political well, agenda, no, no, you should no, no, not no, be no, a parent. No, 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 I wonder no, why no, white no, folks no, adopt no, black kids no, all the time. You always no, see no, white no, families no, adopt no, black no, children but, but from I, Africa, I, 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 and I'm like, that, why can't you adopt, no, 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 you know, no, a little no. white kid? When you look at television, when you look at reality TV, I feel, just from what I'm seeing, I don't go off of statistics and data, that's a bunch of BS. I go off of what I see. <laughs> when Homeboy has said that he doesn't believe in data or statistics, I don't think it was a subtle eye roll. I definitely got whiplash. How else do you make a point that is professional and mature if you're not citing data and you're not citing research and you're calling it all bull That scrapped all of his credibility for me. You're talking about kids of gay parents and you're saying that they're all these things and I, the person you're talking about, I'm sitting here telling you you're wrong and you're still interrupting me, and you're still invalidating me, and you're still telling me that your opinion must be right, even though you're not in my shoes. 
That was really shocking. Yeah, I wanted to respond to some earlier points. We've been talking a lot about what is natural, what is order. Um, I'd like to say that there are many, many studies of over 1,500 non-human species of animals that have, they parent in their species children that are not biologically theirs. I also don't think that reproduction is the end-all be-all of what a family is to be. Um, you're allowed to have your own biblical beliefs. I totally understand that and respect that. Um, what you're talking about with sustainability, I'm not suddenly going to tell all the straight people to suddenly partner up with people of the same sex and no longer reproduce. It's a minority of people that are queer that do want to have children. And I just think that they should be allowed to have children. And I don't think that they are depriving the children of anything. Um, because I think the foundation of what a family should be is to provide a child with love and support and raise them into respectable, upstanding citizens. I think it's important to have masculine energy, to have feminine energy, to have any other energy that there is. I just don't think that that is necessarily the job of the parents to incorporate these gender roles into it. Are we, are, are we able to qualify note, something before on the next note, one? On May I respond no, to Elizabeth? No, no, no. Reset. I need to know, reset, I need to know reset, reset, reset. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. It's necessary for parents to have open dialogue about sex with their children. Man, hell no. It depends. I do believe it's necessary, but I believe you have to do it at an appropriate age. But once they're ready, then I think you should have those conversations so that they don't have to go outside the family for that information. I never felt comfortable going to my parents um, at all, or my mom. I never felt comfortable going to her. I would like to create a space for my child, which I have, where I hope that no matter what happens in her life, that she feels comfortable going to me at least. And then I will help her or together we'll determine if she's actually ready for the conversation, and hopefully she is. I definitely agree with you. I think um, it's so important to be able to have a dialogue so that kids feel like they can come to you and not necessarily enforcing that you have to come to me for this. One thing is like when it's much younger. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. <sighs> Do you want to talk about it? I just haven't been told I was raised wrong in a long time. <laughs> This is just a lot of trauma associated with this. Um, and it's not trauma for my family. It's trauma for people telling me it's wrong. I know my family is right, and I know my family is normal. <laughs> I didn't know it. I didn't know my family was not normal until other people decided to tell me that. And that was nobody else's business to it say that. No one else's business. Absolutely not. And this is my biggest fear for my two daughters. For me, I feel like I have to prepare them as much as humanly possible for that outside world that can tell you that you're wrong or that your family is wrong, because that's one of my biggest fears. I wouldn't. I don't think anybody said wrong, but a lot of people. I, say I grew wrong. up in a less than ideal family. A less than ideal, I think, is where as but humans, right? There was nothing right? less ideal about her shit That's situation. What, no, this is what she's hearing, though. This is what she That's is what perceiving hearing, that she's though. hearing. Well, well, I'm you know? hearing it too. I'm hearing yeah, the invalidation too. of her family, of the structure. She's got a two-parent household right now. That's most true. hetero, most heterosexual families end up in divorce. We don't. Also, every single we screwed don't. up person I know has a mom and a dad. We don't end up Every divorced. single screwed up Valid. person has Valid. a mom and a dad. Absolutely. I've met nobody royally screwed up with two moms and two dads. That's that. And honestly, most gay kids' parents are straight. We come from we come from y'all. Well, they parents. all have to. <laughs> well, Biologically. Well, no. They all, not necessarily. No. no, not not the adoptive Unless you're kids, having kids. But they all came from kids. a straight relationship. But our parents are yeah. heterosexual. No, I'm I'm biologically related to one of my dads. My brother is biologically related to the other, and they had us via egg donation and surrogacy. So there's still a biological connection in my house, but and and I'm glad I have that connection. But I also have one of my dads who has straight parents was adopted, and it like you know it just bi biology doesn't necessarily mean anything. And I, I wish people would like stress it less because that's where a lot of the hate comes from is, oh, if you're gay, clearly something's wrong. If you have two dads, clearly something is wrong with you. And like we automatically assume that people, children like me or people like my parents aren't as good as purely because they're different. Nobody, and, nobody said that. 
not, no one said it in this room, but like the world says it. And, it, and that's not fair. And let's just, everyone just take a breath, just take a moment before we circle back to the prompt, okay? Just take a deep breath. Do we feel okay to, yeah? Okay. It's necessary for parents to have open dialogue about sex with their children. I would also say that from a young age, we can talk about things that are involved with like sex ed, but not explicitly sex. For instance, like consent is a very important topic that I think should be brought up as young as possible. Um, we mentioned before about the case of you don't have to hug your uncle if you don't want to, or hey, do you want help cleaning that mess up or something? I think those are inherently part of good sex education, but they're not explicitly like about sex. I think growing up, I didn't have much social media. So like, I never like saw this stuff, but I go on Instagram now, every like, just so many posts, so many stories are just about all of these things about sex consent. And it can really go both ways, right? There's extremes on both sides, but the age that it starts at, you should really just encourage your kid to like, you should tell them the bare minimum, the biological standard, right? There's two bi biological sexes, stuff happens, but really let them do their own research and encourage them to research both sides rather than just like mainly what pushing What age are you saying? Religion? Whenever they get social media, whenever they first hear about it and they have any questions about it. So I grew up with religious and conservative parents, but they never made it clear that those two parts of my identity were the only things that were to rule my entire lifestyle. So what I mean by that is growing up, I would hear about politics. Whenever I would ask them a question about it, they never made it clear what their stance on it was because they wanted me to explore both sides. And if I ask them questions, you know, they always tell me to explore the thing first, you know, go on Google research, go to different sources, and then we can have a discussion once I've really been truly informed. If we're empowering them to do their own research, they can get into the very wrong sides of doing that research. For instance, most people I know got their sex ed from porn. And if we're talking about, you know, sex and consent, I, I don't think anyone in this room is thinking that porn is a great example yeah. of sex ed. Um, my but, son definitely, yeah. I definitely caught my son watching porn and he's 14 years old and it was a conversation. And I didn't shame him, mm -hmm. you know, but, but if this is already happening, what do I look like coming at him and reprimanding him and telling him this is a boundary or we don't do this in this house because you're going to go to well, all this action. It's like, no, this is already happening. So if now I'm just now finding out about it. So now there's a communication like, and we actually had a whole on conversation about why this isn't real and why this is not okay for you. You're gonna be an adult the rest of your life, honey. Be a 14 year old right now. And he's like, you're right, mom. Eh, worry about it again. You're probably still sneaking and watching porn, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna be able to stop that. I'm gonna be able to communicate with them and do the best I can do. That's all we can do as See, parents. but that's good. Cause you, you told him about this stuff before it got worse. So I have a son and a daughter. Well, my son is almost seven, my daughter's four. So, you know, I don't like to keep that, like if one's showering, the other's in their room and vice versa. But one thing I guess I stepped forward for was mostly because we use the word penis. We use the word vagina. I want them to know their anatomy. I want them to know that this is what you have. This is your, nobody touches this. Nobody sees it other than you. Or like if I'm giving you a shower or helping you wipe your butt, like things like that. You know, I learned about sex from boys being gross in class. I didn't know how anything worked and that's kind of because, like you said, you didn't have a good relationship with your parents. I didn't have that. I wasn't comfortable asking my mom or my dad, like, what is this? They probably should have been the ones to educate me first. Probably wouldn't have became a teen parent, but. Yeah, I only hung back because I, I, I agree and I disagree. Like for me, it was very, it was very interesting. Uh, I have mom and dad. Uh, my mother is a, a very, uh, very Latin woman. Uh, so it's kind of funny that she was the one who I talked to about sex more than my dad. I don't think I've ever said more than two words to my dad up until this day about sex. So for my daughter, I almost kind of want to mirror that for obvious reasons. I mean, that might just be a better conversation for her mom to have with her. I mean, I'm willing to have a conversation, but I also feel a little bit uncomfortable at the same time. Maybe that has to do with my past. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think the younger people here have it so incredibly difficult and so incredibly easy just because they have everything available to them at the same time where like me, you, like you over there, like you have to figure stuff out from like, you know, blurry VHS tapes or like slow, <laughs> slow internet downloads and stuff like that. So it's very like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not jealous of you guys at all. That's um, fair. That's yeah. fair to say that I might not feel comfortable talking to my daughter about intercourse. Right, yeah. That's completely, it was yeah. way easier for me to talk to my son about how bitches are. Like, look, 
you're good at basketball, you know what I'm saying, or you're good at af athletics and, and whatnot. Like, I know how women are going to be. When it They're comes to, to courting, be... yeah. Like, Absolutely. I could, I could talk to her probably a lot easier than Absolutely. I can about I, I said disagree because of the word necessary. I, I don't think that it's necessary. Um, you know, everyone's watched Animal Planet. Nobody teaches the, the, lion, the lion cubs how to have sex or what, <laughs> what to do. I think it's ingrained in all of us. Um, I think it's just something that is the result of evolutionary biology. My dad was a very strong masculine figure in my life and he was always there for me, but I never had the birds and the bees talk. I just, I never had it. I went through puberty. I felt all the things that young boys feel going through puberty. I used my eyes and I looked around the world. Um, I talked to my friends like curious kids do and we figured it out and we, we kind of knew what was going on. But something you said actually made me think and almost reconsider if I made the right choice. Um, and that was about pornography. Because this is a very big issue uh, and it's very pervasive in our society today. The average age of first exposure to pornography in this country is 11. And some social scientists are saying that it's getting younger every year. To keep people viewing, to keep the, the dopamine hits coming to these viewers, these young viewers, it's escalating behaviors. It's rape, it's incest, it's aggression. It is these horribly violent behaviors that they're learning for the first time. You know, by, by 18 years old, it's over 90% of young boys have seen porn and 60% for young women. And that is something that we have to recognize. Uh, I think it is good to have some, some discussions about this. But I also think that this ties back to why it's important to have a two-parent home. Because it's not just about telling your kids what is right. Kids are very visual learners. And so when they see your mother and father interacting with each other in a loving, nurturing way, they internalize that. They see that and, and they in turn go out and they treat other people like that, whether that's their girlfriend or boyfriend. And so that's, I think, one of the big values of having a two-parent, two-sex home. I think being honest, because even being conservative, I think we can be a little hypocritical, like we're so perfect and we have this perfect family, but it's like, no, your mama was a hoe. Yeah, you know, your dad used to do, your dad used to sniff coke, uh, you know, so we're not perfect. And just being honest and transparent and seeing, you know, certain things in our children and being able to address those things in a timely manner. So I don't think that it's necessary for, for my kids' age to talk about sex. And I would rather them just for now see the intimacy between a mother and a father before I drop that ball, you know, on them, so. Children should strive to meet their parents' expectations. Amy. Yes. <laughs> right, like that's a valid question. What are those expectations? Do we do we do we expect our kids to be rocket scientists as soon as they're born? Probably not. If it's like good upstanding citizens who love and respect their family and their friends, I think so. And I'm sure there, there are some children of immigrants here who probably have a very high standard expected of them from the day that they were born or the day that they moved to this country. And that's one thing I wish Asian American households like changed. We should always be expecting improvement. I think that's the one thing that parents should always be putting on their kids. The thing is, I was, I was really bad at math. Like I like did not learn how to add positive and negative numbers until like seventh, late eighth grade, which is really, really bad, okay, especially for an Asian. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, it doesn't matter where your kid starts, you should always be encouraging them to improve. You don't set quantitative standards for them, saying get an A on this, get B on this. What you should be encouraging is, oh, you got a C? Try to get C plus, B. Small steps are what gets your kid there. I don't want to create, uh, not create, but raise a child that is reckless like okay well you have the freedom be yourself express yourself do whatever you want and then you know she comes home <clears throat> you know 16 and pregnant I'm like you did this and blah blah blah, blah. well dad you didn't tell me anything mm -hmm. so the expectations isn't to be perfect but just take a little bit of the things that she's learned you know that they've learned from their mom and dad and utilize them in their life to the best of their abilities and if they can do that I'm happy with it my parenting style I feel is I would say it's strict but it's not strict you know, although my children aren't allowed to be exposed to certain things, uh, they still have an amazing way of life because they get to do things with their mother and father who are actually present while they're in their presence instead of scrolling on social media and um, ignoring the child, you know, when the child could be needing you uh, more than you think. So I pride myself on being as present as I can and setting that strong foundation for my children. I think it's also important to teach your kids that the expectations you're setting for them and those goals that you're setting for them isn't for you, 
it's for them. And that's something really important that my parents taught me was that here are the goals, here's what we expect out of you. But at the end of the day, your successes are your own and your failures are your own. And one day, mom and dad aren't gonna be here and you're gonna have only yourself to look to for your accomplishments. And so it's setting the goals and setting the bar, but then making them realize this is all you. The ball's in your court and your life is in your hands. It's not in ours. The expectation that I have is just they're the best person that they could that they could be. And I think that's the same for every parent. I mean, that's the, the goal and the wish that your child is happy and healthy and content of who they are and what they're doing. And of course, I'm gonna push them uh, to take the next step and I'll always push them. But, you know, I think that expectation is, is a valid one. I agree with a lot of the stuff you guys were saying, but the reason I didn't fully step forward was I immediately thought of my parents. And my parents both grew up in um, conservative homes and were told that they should, the, the whole goal was to um, go to college, get a wife and have kids. If the expectation, if my parents met the expectation that they were gonna have a, get married and have a wife and have kids, one, they might've killed themselves and not been here today. Two, I definitely wouldn't have been here. My brother wouldn't have been here. So it can't be the end all be all to meet your parents' expectations. My parents are immigrants from India, and their expectation for me is to accomplish the American dream, to blend into white society, to blend into like rich American society. They placed me from the age of five in a all boys school um, until the age of 15. And their expectation was for me to blend in. I'm sorry, I can't meet that. Like I'm a woman, I'm not gonna meet your expectation of going to an all boys school. That, I don't think that's me doing something wrong there. That's me just living my truth. But there's other expectations that I think are very appropriate for them to have me meet. You know, they want me to go to a good college. They want me to succeed and be happy and accomplish my dreams. And I think those are all wonderful, but I think it's not so black and white. Um, yeah. Elementary schools should teach students about sexual orientation and gender identity. I don't think they should teach like queer theory or like <laughs> college level yeah. gender classes, but I think they should be taught that these kinds of people exist in the world and you will grow up in a world with where you need to love and respect these people. Yeah, for me, that like if, if we're talking specifically elementary school, for me that just looks like having a book in the classroom that is about a two-dad family or is about someone um, discovering that they like to wear dresses and then maybe that that disagrees with what they were born as, you know? Just something like a children's book or just some kind of picture on the wall that represents that. It, it doesn't have to be anything beyond that that's not age appropriate. You know, it, this doesn't involve gay sex education or um, hormone therapy or like, if we're talking like elementary school kids, it's just it's just representation. Like just putting it on everyone's radar that I think those people are out there. At its core, it's not about you have to agree with this and this mm -hmm. is an agenda. It's about you can agree with this, you can disagree with this, but you need to respect it. You know, growing up, I didn't have those books. I was questioning myself if I'm normal, quote, or if I'm, you know, if there's something wrong with me, uh, why do I have these feelings? Is this correct? Because I never had a conversation with my parents. My parents are straight. My whole family is very conservative. So it was really difficult for me to accept myself because I didn't see the acceptance anywhere else. It's, it's the exact same thing as different cultures, different religions. It's just another diverse area that you need to be exposed to. And it's like me being okay with uh, schools being taught uh, heterosexual relationships. Like, I'm okay with that. That's something <laughs> part of the world, of course. Like, I didn't get any education from it from school. And you know, kids use like, that's gays. Like, you're gay, like as a derogatory, you know? So for me, it could be as simple as like, this girl has two dads. My kids have two moms. Simple. Is it Brittany? Yeah. Okay, so you made a statement just now that where you said you, you think it should just be like, this exists and this exists and not go any further. So I think my problem with the school system teaching our children these things is that it doesn't just stop there. And also, what if your boundary is different from her boundary, from his boundary? From, Everybody's boundary is a little bit different, right? As parents. Absolutely. So 
I don't think the schools understand that. And I don't think government schools really should be raising our children, which they are now, right? You know, we should be raising, really raising our own children. And, and if we have to put our children in a public school, hopefully they're learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, and the social things, and the cultural things, and the religious things that, we're, that are valuable to each one of us should come from inside our household. My approach with parenting is to be very loving, very tender, a very good role model. Some people would say I do some attachment parenting because we still sleep in the same bed, but really it's, um, it's for a number of reasons, and one being safety, and two being it's more fun than being across the house from my daughter when we're the only two people in the house. We just have a very tender, loving relationship. I wanted to make sure that I cultivated that in my, my relationship with my child, because I felt like I grew up without that tenderness and that love and that security in my household. So I wanted to make sure that I provided that for my daughter, no matter what. You said, I'm so sorry to keep bringing this up. I don't wanna like trauma bond or anything, but like you didn't have a good relationship with your parents. You weren't able to go and talk to them about sex or your period Correct. or things like that. Correct. Where was the best place to get that information other than school sex ed for you? That's a great point. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought that up. I wish that my parents were open and communicative. I had a similar situation um, to you. And so I ended up learning it from my friends. <laughs> so friends and magazines and VHS tapes, somebody mentioned, like you learn about these things other ways, but still the, it should come from the family, I it believe. Should. I, it should, doesn't always It should come from the family. It, you, because I, I can almost guarantee that every single person here, and every, anybody who's a parent or just has a parent, we all have a different idea of what we want our children to learn and not learn about these particular social constructs and sex in but general. But we exist. That's yeah, the thing but, is yeah, that we it's exist. sexual orientation a construct. I want to add on to that. No. So I agree with a lot of what you guys were saying when you guys are up here about representation. We should be teaching our kids that people of different sexualities, you know, family types, they exist. But when you have one entity, one curriculum, one school, one government, when you have only one entity teaching a thing that can go both ways in a lot of different directions, there's a lot of room for bias. Like, I, I want my kids when I grow up, I want them to know that, that these different things exist, but in school, it's just so hard to regulate what's going on. And I see news stories all the time about these children's books. There's one book about teaching, I don't know the name, but it's about a girl exploring her sexuality. And in the book, it literally says, her friend said, maybe you should try tasting your vaginal discharge to see if you like it or not. And the thing is, nobody's advocating for this stuff, at least I hope not, but the, do you see, it, it just, it can get so, it can get out of hand so quickly. So that's it's understandable when it's hard to regulate. But again, in schools, it is curriculum, so it wouldn't be anything outside of, but it was being taught in the curriculum. Yeah. Like the yeah. students were being taught. Yes. These yeah. books are students in the classroom. Reading. I think some teacher would be wilding out well, and right. bringing in their yeah. own, the their own personal yeah. stuff that's not yeah. supposed to be in the curriculum. That's just absolutely wild. not. Like, that sounds wild. We forget that, you know, we talk about, you know, the school system and all that stuff, but we forget that these teachers are people too mm -hmm. you know um my, a lot of these teachers are my age you know they're young exactly like so, so my daughter when that. she went into kindergarten um her teacher was amazing great she loved my daughter treated her very very well but the first time i went to back to i think it was back to school not a parent teacher conference there was literally the whole classroom was surrounded with rainbows and I'm like, rainbow pencils, rainbow ABCs, rainbow, rainbow, ra I'm like, okay, we need to know our colors. They need to know our, their colors, that's cool. But it, turned, it, went, it went from like, okay, you're teaching them to, okay, what is this? Like, you know, I don't care if you are gay or whatever was you- Was she a gay educator too? No, 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 she, you know, she was married, had kids. <laughs> I don't know if her kids were or anything like that, but it just was like, what are you trying to do? It just felt weird. Did I think some- no, but no, 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 absolutely not. No. That, but I mean, for a 50 year old woman to have a thousand rainbows in the classroom when I grew up and there was maybe one or two or three, what's seems a bit excessive. What, what's the, the fact that it was thought that because there was rainbows in the classroom that that was pushing agenda to these kids is just ludicrous to me. I mean, to think that a queer person, whether they're a parent or not, has a particular agenda to push LGBTQ community on other people is just ridiculous. And it really, it triggered something in me and I, I, I bit my tongue <laughs> during that time. When I was in fifth grade, 
I had a gay teacher. We all knew he was gay. We all loved him. And I also had a classmate with, with two moms. And the teacher recognized and said, this, this student has two moms. That's perfectly fine. We're not gonna go any further than that. Recognizing and seeing the student and telling them that they're safe here. The problem today is what you were talking about is that it's not just recognition, it's almost indoctrination. It's, it's taking it past just showing people that yes, you exist and I recognize you. I took uh, sex ed in fifth grade too and it was very simple. It was the boys went in one classroom with the male teachers and the girls went into another classroom with the female teachers. And we talked about the anatomy. We could ask questions about sex and questions about puberty. And other than that, that was kind of it. But now across this country, you're seeing these types of books that aren't just talking about the biology and the anatomy and teaching kids about procreation. It's talking about pleasure. It's, it's pornographic material. And that has no place in the classroom. And unfortunately, we're almost having to, to step back and have no sex education, which you want, which we want, which we want sensible sex education because people are taking it so far. And, and my question, my question to, to those people that, that agreed is, why do you not think that parents can sufficiently uh, and appropriately determine how and when they talk to their kids about sex? And why are these teachers so eager to talk to other parents' children about sex and gender ideology? I've literally traveled the country reporting on this indoctrination, on the, the drag queen story hour, on the transition closets, on the coming out day. And whether or not you agree with those, that's fine if you agree with them, but you have to also agree that your child is in a classroom with parents that feel very strongly about those issues, and that has to be left to the parent. It is not the teacher's job to say, today's coming out day, or to say that you're, you can be called by this pronoun or this pronoun, or you can go in either classroom to talk about this anatomy or this anatomy. It's just not your job. When it comes to pronouns, I feel like that teacher is creating a safe space for that child in case they do come home and they cannot come That's out to That's what it comes guys. down to. It's, it's, it's creating safe spaces for the children that aren't like Like, I, I didn't mean to point you guys Honestly. out, no, but you but, both but are very religious. Right. And I personally come from a very religious household. No offense, but I am uncomfortable as hell, you know, being... Around Christians. Not necessarily Christians, but people Catholics. that... Catholics. We can be pretty tough. <laughs> no, I don't mean to like make no, you guys no, feel uncomfortable. I understand comfortable. what you're saying because it, it's it's a two sided coin. Absolutely. You know, it, it's like. Well, know, it's a convenience I, to be Christian. It's I'm going to be right. I'm going to be Christian of the, of the old covenant and not right. know what Christianity really means on the new covenant. And I know Christianity well, because I, I was I, went to a ministerial school for three years. So you want to talk about the Bible? We can talk about it. But LGBT is not even talked about in the new covenant where Jesus Christ came and washed away my sins. And I'm a Christian. Pause, because we do have to move on. I want to hear from Mike. Oh, well, no, I was just going to say that, that, you know, my wife and I plan to homeschool for a multitude of reasons. Specifically, we don't want the state involved in our child's education. There are a bunch of subjects we don't even think should be taught to begin with, like earth science. What the hell is that all about? <laughs> um, but to point to Aldo's point, one of the reasons why, especially recently, why we, why we decided this was because we went to our local school district's library and those books absolutely exist. And we were told by the librarian that an eight to 12 year old can take those books out without their parents' permission. And these books, they're kind of like comic booky types. Some of them are, but some of them have extremely pornographic uh, descriptions. Some of them have visual aids. Some of them are talking about, hey, try a blowjob, see how it makes you feel. Some of them talk about fingering yourself. I am absolutely not open to having my daughter look at that stuff, let alone even hear about it from other kids. Um, and second of all, with the teachers in the classrooms, I feel like there is a larger subset of teachers who seem to have an agenda. This is just what I see optically. Um, and it's just not something that I'm comfortable with, so. Can I quickly ask Ra a question? Yeah. You talked about creating a safe space for students with pronouns. Do you recognize that some parents that feel very strongly about these issues, that by these teachers creating these safe spaces for students and introducing all the students to the, the spectrum of gender ideology creates a dangerous space for that, that other child, At that home? it's introducing them do to I an idea that, that the parents feel strongly about? Do I think creating a safe space for queer and trans kids creates an unsafe place for straight kids? Absolutely not. That the parents, though, that you recognize that the parents could feel that way, that the introduction of these ideas is not aligning all, with their values and it's not okay. Home. I, I agree a thousand percent with homeschooling. I worked at LAUSD for 10 years and I've seen a lot of shit that goes on in, in the school district. I absolutely believe that it starts at home. And if you give your kids a good foundation at home, they should be able to have a little bit of a foundation when they go to school and, and recognize these different things. Like, oh, I don't agree with that. I don't get jiggy with that, but I'm not gonna hate and disrespect 
disrespect the person that does. So because there are kids that are committing suicide, there are kids that are coming to school that, that come to school for safety, for food, not only just to learn about sex ed, but literally because they have no other place to go but to go to school for food in the morning. What about the kid though who's made to feel out to be like a pariah? Let's say if there's one kid who's like, well, you know, that's maybe not what I believe with the pronouns or with any sort of I'm that uh, kid. Sexual... I don't care right, about right, right, pronouns. Right. Absolutely. Right, exactly. Sure. So yeah. now today, I feel like there are kids who are probably going to be pariahed by their teacher. Maybe if they're, you know, if he or she's a bad teacher, I don't know. But that's not necessarily inclusive or maybe a safe space for that one child who, you know, may feel like I don't believe in any of this stuff. It's not just about making the kids in the school feel safe. It's about educating the people that don't know how to treat other people outside of the school. So they can take that with them and respect people that are not inside the school. Sometimes a child needs a spanking. This is interesting because, ooh, let me get close. I feel that every kid needs a spanking, though my wife and I have decided that we're not gonna spank our kid, if that makes any sense. Like, it does. <laughs> I, I grew up being spanked, and yeah. I turned out all right for it, but I, I do think that spanking can be, or you know, physical, what's the word? Correction. Physical discipline or physical correction mm -hmm. uh, can be useful, but uh, yeah, not for mine. The thing is, like, you can take this question both ways. There are cases where you should not spank a child. Yeah. But I think about behaviors that are, have been ingrained, that have been enabled for a long time, that are terrible, and they should stop. So I used to work at a tech summer camp, and there was this little girl who's the demon. She would, like, go up to the Indian kids, say, you're ugly, you're brown, you smell. Like, these are things that are enabled. Yeah. A kid isn't born and has this hate towards Indian people, you know what I mean? So I think a case like that, and the, when the mom came, she was just like, honey, you can't continue doing that. It's been enabled. So I think there are cases where the only way to get to the kid's head is by showing like extreme like concern. And like for some parents, you know, that can come through spanking. But I don't think it should be used for like mild cases like you gotta be on a test or something like that. Right. So. Well, and what do we do? We mirror our parents' behavior. So because I grew up with, you know, my mom spanked me and my dad rarely did, but if you ever like if he ever got to the point of a spanking, it happened. But I think that my first inclination when my daughter would have a tantrum would just almost kind of be like to either grab her really hard or to just think about, you know, this kid needs a spanking. And I used to tell my wife, I used to be like, just, just let me do it. Let me see what happens. But just kind of restrained ourselves. And we just said, you know, we decided at first and it may, may seem like a very like unconservative thing to say, but like, yeah, we came to the decision. We're not going to do that. So for me, um, you know, being African-American, I feel like our forms of discipline are more um, brutal in some senses, uh, because they're not really given with love. You know, uh, you know, I remember g getting whoopings just for laughing too early in the morning on a Saturday watching cartoons, you know, so because they're trying to sleep. So I think that like when I spank my daughter, I always make sure she understands why she's getting the spanking. So it's not, you know, she touched something and then I, you know, get her. It's, hey, you know, you shouldn't climb that because you're, you can fall and really hurt yourself. And then I leave the room and come back in and she's doing it. It's like, okay, you know, so uh, the term that I've always used with her when uh, I've given her spankings is, do you need understanding? Mm. And she's like, daddy, I don't want understanding. Like, I don't want any understanding. But after I've spanked her, I'll give her a minute and then I'll come back in the room and say, all right, let's have a conversation. And sit down like, why did I spank you? Because daddy, I was climbing the ladder. What could have happened? I could have really fallen and hurt myself. So what do we not do? Climb the ladder if you're not there. It's done. Right, this goes back to the, the conversation we were having about expectations and trying to meet those expectations. And as a parent, if you set an expectation for your child that has to do with their safety and it's not met and you don't correct them, then that's actually not loving. Then that's actually not showing your child that there are consequences to the actions um, and that'll lead them to doing the same behavior over and over again. And I'll also say that it's, if, if you are constantly having to spank and use this extreme measure, then you're probably doing something else wrong that needs to be corrected first. So it, it does have to be used sparingly and not that extreme. Um, you're exactly right. I grew up in a Latin household, I'm Puerto Rican, and we got the switch, we got the belt, we got the hand, we got the fist, we got all of it. You get the backhand? The backhand with we the got rings the, We the got word. the wooden spoon, we got all of it. And it was terrifying at times, honestly. And sometimes I didn't feel it was justified. Sometimes it was justified but I didn't want to create an environment for my child where it was severe punishment that felt like 
they were so terrified of me that they weren't going to be able to be somewhat free, right? right? The punishment needs to fit the crime. If you look at the animal kingdom, I'll talk about that again, but they physically correct their young ones when there's danger, when they're, when they're out of line, and they teach them because ver verbalizing doesn't always work. And I think it should just be minor corrections. I don't think we should get into the realm of abuse, obviously. And also, I feel like these days you can't even touch your child without you know somebody wanting to call CPS on you. When I was growing up, there was no laws. You could just beat the tarnation out of your child, apparently. But um, but now, you know, you have to be very careful legally. But from a biological standpoint, I think it should just be very slight and the punishment should fit the crime. The first thing that bugs me about this conversation that it always seems to be, oh, ha, 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 yeah, I got the smack and ha, ha, And it always ends up being a laughter that follows what, stories of people getting spanked. Um, I was spanked. Uh, I had my mouth washed out with soap. Uh, I had my pants literally pulled down around my ankles and spanked in front of my in front of my friends. As a child, first of all, that embarrassment it was hard to come back from. Very very hard. Not only that, but my relationship with my father completely suffered because of it. I resented him. I hated him. I feared him. And it was a long, like, I'm still trying to repair it from this day. And I think that as a parent, now that I'm in that position and my child acts up, yeah, of course, we, we have to discipline them. But sending them to time out, which they hate and despise, and then having that conversation of why did you go to time out? And they understand and they repeat what they're not supposed to do. You know, it works and they don't do it again. And I think we can get the point across and discipline our children without abuse, without hitting, without spanking, because that is a lasting impression on a child. I think with the lasting impression, right, the physical pain is temporary, the mental pain is lifelong forever. And I don't think that a child and now adults should have to live with that trauma for the rest of our lives just because our parents wanted to correct us in that one moment. Honestly, I don't think spankings are really effective. Um, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. I come from parents that we had a huge leather belt. And I would, now that I think about it, we'd always get told, oh, don't make me get the leather belt. And dad did get the leather belt, but I never got hit with that belt. And it was more to put, invoke that fear because I could never imagine my parents honestly hitting me. And I didn't have to get hit to mind or to respect them. But the moment that my parents were to hit me, I would lose respect for them because I wouldn't expect, I'm, I don't expect my parents to have to hit me. I don't think that's what parents should have to do. If you can't use your words to articulate to your children to respect you, we have a bigger problem. Yeah. First time I ever did get physically spanked was by my grandpa's wife. I lived with her and blah, blah, blah. And she, she smacked me and I smacked her back. You know, like I wasn't going to take that. I don't take that kind of disrespect. And like, I don't touch my kids like that. I don't feel like my little four-year-old daughter why does she need to be spanked? She's four. My six-year-old, he's still learning the world around him. He doesn't need that. That's Thanks. abusive to me. No offense, but like, I just see it as abuse. Spanking absolutely was something I couldn't imagine even speaking of on camera for millions of people to see. And I don't see the point of abuse in children as little as six, four, you know, that's very young and very imprinting on children that, you know, are gonna grow up and think that that's how you discipline and that's how you get people to hear what you're saying. It leaves mental scars when it's used in the wrong scenario. So we were talking about that earlier. If you're spanking your kid every single day, there's a, there's, you should change your parenting, but right. you only use it when it's a terrible behavior that needs to stop. Like when I was little, okay, I used to shoplift, okay? I would get away with it. I thought you could just take a candy bar and then leave. But after like my parents, found these like chocolate bars that they weren't paying for, they spanked me and as they should, because if they hadn't spanked me, they just said, honey, don't do this. I would have kept stopped. doing it. If they just said, don't no. do that shit, you might have just stopped no. or, or took something away from you or used a different effective ways. The thing like, is taking things away from my son, like me smacking my son, my son's 14 years old, who's bigger than me, stronger than me, me emasculizing my son and smacking him as a woman, 
and telling him he's doing something wrong, that's wild. That's not gonna be effective at all. It's, no, hey, let's talk about this. You're gonna get the Xbox taken away. You know, I'm not gonna take you this AAU practice that we're spending, spending $400 on. We're gonna do something that's gonna be really effective that you actually are going to remember. Because hitting, after a while, that shit don't mean nothing. All right, keep on hitting me. Keep on hitting me. I, that's, that's, my, that's, that's my middle no, brother. I agree with that being, <laughs> you know, only, at 15, extreme, being six, okay, seven. Too. You know what I mean? So, you know, my but mom when you're was 12. like, well, you know, my, my mom was like your height. You know, so I think to kind of go off what you were saying, the laughter part. We're not laughing because of the spanking. It's more so, and I hope this makes sense. It's laughing because of the experience of love in the discipline that I experienced with my daughter and the fact that she now understands and I know that she won't make that same mistake again. Now to what you were saying, um, after spanking her, I, I don't even remember the last time I've spanked my daughter because now even with my two year old, when they're acting up or doing something or screaming or going crazy and I'm like, hey guys, stop. And they're still going, I'll get the belt and I'll just jingle. Okay, dad, we're sitting down. And I'm like, oh, so you, you guys are good? Yeah, Dad, we're good. It's like, I don't have to. It's a respond to stimuli. It's a, it's a they're absolutely they're like, oh shit, we don't want to get hit. We don't so want to get hit, hit but out. also it's a respect thing. Like, that's my father. He's in there, you know, trying to work on the computer or something. We are screaming too loud. It's the job of the parent to make sure the child can come to them for anything and everything and overall love. Why would you teach a child that that person would hit them? That's it. The sexuality of parents influences their kids' sexuality. Now, if we're talking about sexuality as in just, you know, um, being well, openly, <laughs> openly like, uh, I hope I'm wording this the right way, promiscuous or your behaviors, um, I think it does. Um, a lot of things that I do, my kids do. A lot of things that my wife do, you know, they follow her. So I think if um, I was behaving in a certain way and, um, you know, behaving, treating my wife a certain way in front of my daughters and my son, you know, I think it would affect the way that they uh, treat themselves and the way they, they treat others. And um, would look at sex as more as an object or just something to do more than a intimate, um, think that you have with one person that, you know, creates a real bond and a friendship. The thing about childhood is that every kid has a normal one because there's no frame of reference. Everything's relative. So whatever you put into that child's life becomes their normal. Children that are from same-sex uh, same households they have a higher chance of identifying as LGBTQ. And you could claim that this is because they're more accepting um, and more receptive to that. But I would say that, I, I would point to the, the generations, that each generation, as, as they got older, the amount of people, the percentage of people that identify as LGBTQ doubles each generation. And some of that can be because of acceptance of society, but I, I I do not believe that it is pure acceptance. There is influence that's happening on our social media, uh, that's happening in media or in the world, but it starts at home. And there definitely, there is influence in the home that when you see this as normal, it will of course influence your sexuality and how you view these things. I just wanna say quickly that the sexuality in the home should be a good role model for your children, should be constructive, it should be loving and not toxic. If a child sees sexuality and sees it as toxic, they may just choose to go the other way. A lot of gay people have straight parents. A lot of gay parents produce straight kids. So debunked, you, you cannot, if you're straight, that doesn't mean your child is straight. If you're gay, that doesn't mean your child is gay. I wanna stand firm on the fact that sexuality is biological. Um, it's not something you can choose. And if it's something you want to explore, that's different from choosing. Um, exploring is, oh, maybe I'll go see what it's like being with a woman. Oh, that didn't feel right because it's biological. Yeah, so two points, one of which is something that you had said about <clears throat> them only knowing the gay, that there's two gay parents. And so they relate to that more. Um, in my life, like, yes, there is two gay parents, but we also are surrounded by a lot of straight parents and a lot of straight couples. And their friends come over to play and they have a mom and dad and they come over. So them being only, seeing this one thing and then thinking, oh, maybe I'm gay because that's the only thing I know, 
I don't believe in that. I don't think that. I just think, what is normal to them? Is it normal to, for them to have two dads? Of course, right? Yeah. Having a mom and a dad, is it normal? But it's also That's normal to see made. other kids with their mom and dad too. I mean, they see it all the time. Right. And then my second other was uh, just the fact of a choice. I mean, you talked about it. It's definitely not a choice. If I had to choose way back when I was 15, 14, thinking, oh gosh, I'm gay, I would not choose. To have society constantly looking at me, judging me when I'm out to dinner with my two girls and people come up and go, you're doing such a good job. You don't do that to straight parents who are out with their kids. Like, why come up to me? Yeah, so I would not have chosen to be gay if I had the choice. I am gay, I am happy, my life is amazing, and I wouldn't want it any other way. But back then, when I was figuring things out, I wouldn't have chosen it. What did you say? I said they do, they they do. do, they do compliment straight parents Especially too. Especially being a black father, I get uh, it all day long. On the other side of things, I want to talk about this notion of what is normal influences what you are. I went to an all boys school. I'll say this a million times. I went to an all boys school until I was 15. I did not know what a girl was until I was 15. My parents are heterosexual. They're pretty conservative. They are Christian. Nothing in my environment was saying, you need to be a girl. You are queer. You like are lesbian, right? That was just always within me and nothing in my environment pushed me to do that. Um, I think that is just one very clear example that your environment does not make you have a particular sexuality or gender that is just within you. The way I was parented made me feel safe and seen. My parents already knew that they were getting into parenting um, miles behind other people because the world tells them they're going to be this kind of parent simply because they're gay. From what they've told me before I was born, before my brother was born, it was doing all kinds of research on what works for kids, um, how to raise a girl, um, what girl puberty is like, all of these things. They made sure that they were super educated so that the only reason the world could tell them they were a bad parent is because they were gay. And that means nothing. Um, that comes down to your own opinion. And so I grew up feeling so safe, so supported. I came to my parents with any question and they always had the answer. Um, and I always knew I could grow up being whatever I wanted to be. Uh, and whether that was sexuality, whether that was career-wise, um, honestly, growing up with two dads was really beneficial as a woman because there was nothing impeding on, or there were no boundaries set on what a woman should be or what a woman uh, should act like. It was, no, you go out and your brain is your biggest asset and it's the most beautiful thing about you. Go out and do whatever you want. Women can do whatever men can do. And it was really great, actually, to not have a woman in the household that maybe would have um, derailed that in some way. I half agree. I would say I felt safe. I did not particularly feel seen. My parents don't know what being trans is. They don't really understand what being gay was when I came out to them. They were like, we don't really know what this is, but we love you. And that's what made me feel safe. Even if they don't particularly see me, they came to see me. And at the end of the day, if they say, I love you and you're welcome here, that's what matters. So for me to be met with love from conservative values was pretty shocking because I just have so much experience of observing media where Christians are always paired with anti-LGBT rhetoric and conservatism is not compatible with this. But in my own personal life, I've seen the two be completely compatible. You can be conservative and you can be queer. You can be Christian and you can support LGBT people. And that's something I didn't really think was possible, but my parents proved me wrong in that way. I feel like I grew up with the best parents in the world. They did everything that they could um, to make me the best person I am today. And there were a lot of times growing up that we were going through really difficult times, but they shielded us from that. There were times that we, the lights turned off or the heat turned off. And as kids, we don't know what's going on. We just ask, hey, what's, what's going on? Oh, you know, your mom forgot to pay the bill. And all these things were hidden from us until we were way older and we look back at those things and we realize, no, they, that she didn't forget to pay the bill, or we left the tags on, not because they wanted us to choose a different shirt later on. It, it was because there was serious stuff going on uh, in my family, but they shielded us from that so that we could be kids. And my father, you know, he took me out hunting, took me to my sports, taught me what it was like or, and how to be a man, how to be a good man, how to treat women. Um, and conversely, my mom 
taught me how to nurture women and the things that a mother teaches a young son. Um, and I feel like I had the best parents, the best experience, and I can't think of something better. I can't think of anything better. My dad's probably one of the most soft-spoken individuals I've ever met in my entire life, but I remember instances of feeling safe because I would see him literally snap to dad protection mode when it came to you know anyone trying to harm us or my mother or anything like that. And as far as being seen, my parents, they, they like all of our parents, they had the expectations we talked about, about us being successful in our career. But I had so many wants and desires from being a teenager, like wanting to be, oh, I want to be a magician. I want to be a skateboarder. Who was buying me magician kits? Who was buying me skateboards? Like I had the most supportive, and I guess you can use the word seeing parents that you could ever ask for. And you know, I, I owe them everything that I am today. The person that I am today is because of them. My parents didn't agree with my lifestyle. I came out super, super early. I came out like around 12. Um, I mean, my parents are pastors, but my, my mom always saw me. And when I asked to dress like a boy in like fifth grade, my dad was super resistant because he kind of knew. But you know when your kids are gay early on, you just know. And I think inherently they knew I was gonna be gay and my dad was not getting jiggy with it. And my mom was like, let her be her. Let her be her, she'll figure it out. And I lost my dad about three months ago. Um, parents were married, 50 years, same household. The best people were, were I'll give you a run for your money because my parents were pretty great too. Um, and this last birthday, my parents sent me a card. And it was the first time they've ever said anything like this to me, which is like, we accept you. We unapologetically accept you and we love you. And that meant more to me than anything in the world because I'm 36 years old and finally my mom and dad, and I needed that. And then for people that are hearing this, yeah, your kids, no matter how old they get, they need to hear that their parents accept them and validate them. It's important, it does make you feel good. So yeah, my parents are pretty awesome. I wanna start by saying my dad is not the problem. My dad is super supportive, you know, he, was invited to my wedding. He walked me down my aisle, you know, and my mom wasn't invited. My mom didn't come to my wedding. My mom didn't get to do, you know, the normal bridal stuff because she did not agree with my lifestyle. But this is by far the happiest that I've ever been, the most headstrong that I have been. And if she can't support that, then I don't want her in my life. And a lot of my family and friends have been kind of like, finally, you finally cut her out. And so, you know, it hurts sometimes, but like also I'm protecting my kids from that exposure, that hatred, that acceptance that, that she doesn't have for me. My kids don't need that. It's 2022, These ki my kids are the next generation. I want them to know nothing but acceptance, loving, caring people, that's it. <clears throat> Growing up, you know, I think it was kind of the same way, you know, they didn't tell me a lot in order to protect what I would think about situations. Um, and my, my dad and I, you know, I've kind of talked about that a little bit, but you know, we didn't have a good uh, relationship just because, you know, we did not connect on any kind of level. But my mom and I really, really connected and I felt safe with her uh, up until I came out to her. And it was, it was such a bummer moment because we had such a strong relationship and I felt her just pull away from me when that happened. And it hurt me and we, we didn't talk for a little while and she said she supported me, but her words were not matching with her actions. And especially, the past couple years with what's been going on in the world and politics and all of that, it seems like we're even getting further and further apart. And it's, it breaks my heart and it's sad. And, you know, I, I want to go back to when I was 10 and rekindle that relationship. And now that I have a family and kids and all my family is just so important to me that if she doesn't want to be on board and if she doesn't believe in the beliefs that I have, you know, like I'm, I'm not gonna go out of my way to try to convince you if you're already set in your ways. And it's sad, but it, it's something that, that has to happen. Yeah, Brittany, <laughs> I see you, I see you girl. Um, yeah, like I said before, I didn't have a relationship, a safe relationship with my mom or my dad. Um, so I, I did seek some good modeling. I saw some good modeling with my friends. 
um, and their families. And actually, I, the first time I ever saw somebody say I love you was at my, my friend's house in like sixth or seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And I saw her mom say I love you. And I thought, what? <laughs> they say I love you? Mm -hmm. And then she would sit on her mom's lap and they would hold hands. And I thought, oh my God. It's weird, huh? What are they doing? I, I thought it was so bizarre. Okay, I have the opposite relationship with my daughter. We're very loving, very open, very tender. Um, but honestly, you know, and, and the relationship I, I told you is mended with my, with my parents. But honestly, they're still broken. Everybody's still broken. We're all broken. What mended me the most was, I'll say it again, is having the relationship with my true father. That's what mended me the most out of anything that's ever happened. And I've gone to therapy. I've gone to psychics. I've gone to everybody. And I've done everything you can possibly think of to heal from the traumas. And nothing, nothing healed me like the relationship with Jesus that I have. And that love and that security and that tenderness is that's in that safe space. That's the most safe you'll ever feel because nothing that anybody else on the planet says can matter to you when you know who you are from the creator, 100%. Anybody can throw a stick and a stone at me. None of it matters when you know who you belong to. And so that's what I have conveyed now to my child, that no matter what is on the outside, no matter how much pain each of our families brings to us or our external circumstances bring to us, none of it's gonna shake us because we know who we are. It's kind of hard because I don't know what it's like to be a single black mother, you know? and the, the struggles that come from it. You know, my dad, um, I have a good relationship with him. Uh, the blessing that I, I have of not being seen and not feeling loved is that I got to watch. So being alone, you know, the only child, being alone, I got to see certain behaviors and, you know, I have relatives that do drugs. I'm 33, I've never smoked or drank a day in my life. You know, I've never done, you know, a lot of things. And it's because God, put a hedge around me and a protection around me to be able to watch. I understood at a very young age what love was because I wasn't getting love. So I knew when I had my children, I knew exactly what to do. It is, I understand that, you know, there's mental health, there's trauma, there's a lot of things that are out there that people, you know, suffer with. How do you not know how to love your child? It's, especially as a black man, being a father, um, real quick, uh, one time me and my daughter, we were at a restaurant and I was getting her some food and this guy, this black guy is sitting at the table and he's like watching me and my daughter and I'm like, you know, protection mode. Like, why are you staring at my daughter and she's wearing this dress? You know, I'm just like freaking out, right? So I pay for the food, turn around, he's behind me. And he's like, I just want to tell you, thank you. And I'm like, what's up? He's like, dude, I've been sitting here for three hours waiting for my baby mom to bring my daughter here. I haven't seen her in months. And he was like, and then he, like a tear came down. He's like, I finally got to see what I want. So, you know, to not have that, my mom, she did the best she could. I love my mother. I haven't spoke to my mom in three years. My wife hasn't spoke to her family in six. And it's because of the protection and the love that we have in our home that it's like, hey, you're not gonna come to my house and talk about my daughter because she has mixed hair and you want me to put a perm in her hair because you don't like how curly it is. No, you can go. I don't care if I never see you again. It's about my family. So the cutting off, I'm 100% with you, but the not being seen and not having that love, um, the providing was there, but just not having that love, I feel like I, I took it in as kind of a blessing because now I get to love my kids. Like, yeah. like. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.